My name is Johanna Wagstaff. I'm a meteorologist and an earth scientist. Every day, I see the effects of climate change through my work. A relentless cycle of extreme weather, terrifying storms, deadly heat domes, wildfires, droughts. But I remain in awe of the natural world and how it finds ways to adapt. And that's what we explore on Planet Wonder. What's the weather in five months for my wedding? I don't know. <sighs> you said it wasn't gonna rain. Actually, I did. Now you might think I smirk at our use of weather apps, but I actually love them. I think it deepens our relationship with weather. I just know it's not my forecast, and I worry about our reliance on them during extreme weather. So that got me wondering. How reliable is the weather on your phone? After 15 plus years of weather forecasting, it still amazes me that we can see the future. I mean, predict a hurricane or a heat dome that literally doesn't exist yet. Just particles in the atmosphere that will likely come together in a way that will dramatically affect people. We've come a long way to get to the point where this forecast just shows up on your cell phone. It wasn't until the 19th century that the Western science of weather forecasting really began. Out on the ocean. The electric telegraph meant weather reports could be transmitted from sea to a nearby port faster than the clouds could travel. Game changer. But these early forecasters were really just following the movement of storms without understanding the science behind it. It was Norwegian meteorologists in the early 20th century who worked out the mathematical equations which govern the physics of the atmosphere, the same equations we use today. Thank you, Norwegians. Tuck. Forecasts have become more accurate as we've obtained more data, especially from satellites, and developed super fast computers. There's something else that makes meteorology such a unique science global cooperation. National agencies create their own forecasts, but knowing what the atmosphere is doing in one country helps the forecasts in another. That collaboration is more important than ever. Climate change is not only increasing extreme weather, it's impacting poor countries the most, i.e. the ones that don't have those supercomputers. So what does this all mean for the weather on your phone? To get some perspective, I met up with Chris Doyle, who's done pretty much every kind of forecasting you can imagine, including being chief meteorologist for the 2010 Olympics. Chris, it's so nice to finally meet you. I've been following you for years and, and you know I seem to learn something new about meteorology every day from you, so nice to see you in person. Oh, it's lovely to see you, Joanna. And this is a spot that you come out to quite often. Why, why do you love it out here? I just think it's uh, it's sort of a part of nature, very close to the city. And you're sort of in the weather too, which you is... You totally are. You yeah. can see the sky better here than anywhere else. <laughs> I wanted to start with a question that I get all the time. I'm sure you do too. How reliable is the weather on your phone? Well, it kind of depends to a certain extent what app you're using. So there is one produced by Environment Canada called WeatherCan, I believe it's called. And that, that takes the forecast produced by meteorologists at the Pacific Storm uh, Centre in Vancouver and sort of translates it into icons and small amounts of text and drops it on your phone. And that's produced by people that are looking at the weather 24-7. A lot of apps take information directly from weather models, digital information that create a, a sort of automated forecast hour by hour for really as long as you like. Um, and there's no human inter intervention in that. So if there's problems in those app forecasts early on, they're not gonna be corrected. So mm -hmm. they can be misleading. Hold up, let's hear what you think about those weather apps. How reliable do you think the weather on your phone is? It'll be raining, it'll say, oh, it's only cloudy. So I find it's not really that reliable, but it's to help me like coordinate my outfits. So I always check it. My Apple Watch, it's always on. It's not too bad, it's within one or two degrees and it, it'll tell me whether it's raining or snowing. What app do you use? I just ask Siri, to be honest. <laughs> it's as reliable as the people on the other end of the information, which, depending on where you're looking, you gotta, I, I take the weather like the news, get multiple sources, and then kind of aggregate them, 
and you usually get somewhere in the middle some kind of accuracy. Uh, I 100% approve this answer. That is a smart way to use the weather on your phone. And it also depends on the timeline that you're asking for as well. That, that's right. Uh, most apps are pretty good. If they integrate modules that bring in radar and translate into, into a forecast you can use uh, in the short run. And it also depends where you're asking the question as well and, and how much or how many data points there are around you. Well, that's, that's true. Model quality and forecast quality varies with, sort of varies directly with the number of observations. The more obs you have, chances are the better at least your short-term forecast is going to be. So if you're in an area that's that doesn't have a lot of data, like you're on the west coast of Vancouver Island, forecasts there are going to be at least sort of in the short to medium term less reliable than one well inland where you're in a highly populated area. Forecast? That's my jam. Come with me as I take you through the art of looking into the future, aka let's do a weather forecast together. Now, the basis of every forecast when you're looking into the future is understanding what's happening now because you can't move the atmosphere forward in time until you understand what it looks like right now and I've got a lot of cool tools to do this starting with the satellite I like to start here with a look at the Pacific Northwest if I'm forecasting for Vancouver I really get a sense of where the systems are the shear and twisting I can even tell what heights these clouds are at then I drill down to radar, which is precip happening on the ground right now to get a sense of what's falling from the sky. And most importantly, is taking a look at this gobbledygook. This is weather station data for the Pacific Northwest, and it's an international code in understanding what every weather station is telling us about the weather right now. So where the winds are coming from, temperature, dew point, pressure. And this is where I understand where the fronts and systems are. This is the most important part of my day. So now I have a really good picture of what's happening on the ground, but we have to understand what's happening through the atmosphere as well. So this is a tephagram. Uh, this is the data we get from balloons and it tells us what the atmosphere looks like, the temperature, dew point, the wind direction, and this really gives us a sense of how unstable the atmosphere is. Okay, now we've got the current picture. Let's plug it into the models. There's a couple different ways we can do this. I really like to start with putting the fronts and the weather systems on a current picture and then moving it forward in time. So this is giving you a snapshot of the precipitation, the cloud cover, and these white lines are equal lines of pressure isobars. And you can move this model forward in time to understand how the atmosphere moves forward in time. Accurate forecast saves lives and minimizes property damage. Vital and accurate forecasting is only going to become more crucial in our warming world. So Chris, how has forecasting changed over the years? It's changed enormously over the years. I mean, with the advent of sort of digital technology computers, weather really started to revolutionize in the, in the 60s and, and 70s. So that's when numerical weather prediction models, computer models of the, of the atmosphere could be feasibly developed. People thought of them before. They thought, we can sort of solve this weather problem if we solve enough equations in a yes. fast enough period of time. But the first time they tried it, it took two days to produce a 15 minute forecast. So we've always known the equations of the atmosphere. We just couldn't compute them fast enough. That's right, and that's where computers revolutionized everything. Once you had a machine that could do all those calculations for you, you could produce a forecast in a timely way. In other words, it wouldn't take you two days to do a forecast for 15 minutes that happened two days ago. You could actually project weather out into the future. Wait, I wanna know more. Let's go down the rabbit hole. Before we go further into modern forecasting, let's go back. I've always wanted to try this. Shout out to CBC's OG, Percy Saltzman. And that area of action is even greater than this and more violent. You have a, a very tightly wound up storm that covers all of Western Canada. Here we go. We've got these northerly winds coming in, these southerly winds coming in from the south and southeasterly winds over here. This area of action is greater than this one and more violent too. We've got this tightly wound storm that encompasses all of Western Canada as you can see here. Okay, that was pretty fun. Through my experience, our forecasts are getting better and better. 
Computer models view the, the atmosphere as a, as a three-dimensional series of cubes from the ground up and through the depth of the atmosphere up to, up to about 60 kilometers. And they resolve that whole volume of space into these grid points. And the more grid points you have, the more you can simulate how the, the winds move and the, and the weather is created. And the, but the more grid points you have, the more calculations you need to do, and the faster you need to do them. And it's, so it's this sort of uh, advent of more advanced computing systems, the, the onset of parallel processing in, in computing. And so it is just going to get better and better as computers get faster and faster. To, to a limit. Hmm. One of those limits is data. The more data we put into those computers, the better. And one way to get that data is weather balloons. CBC meteorologist Ashley Browweiler interviewed Carla Hartley. Carla, show us your laboratory. We are going to use hydrogen. We have a hydrogen generator on site. So we use hydrogen to fill up the balloon. Um, uh, how much actually depends on the weather conditions. Um, if there's precipitation outside, then you know you might want to put a little bit more in just because we, we're aiming for a certain ascent rate. Today, I'm going to put in a thousand grams of hydrogen. When we blow it up, it will be about say a meter, meter and a half, or up to two meters uh, big. So this right here is the radio sign. So this is what is attached to the balloon. This has sensors in it for temperature and humidity and this will give us real-time data everything as this is going up it will send back all the information to our grounding station inside and this is how we get all the information from all the parameters as it's going up through the upper atmosphere <laughs> What happens when it continues to go up? How big does it get? So as the balloon goes up, it continuously gets bigger up until almost seven meters or more, where then it will pop, which is seven meters almost as big as a van. And then once it pops, it will descend back down. The temperature, the pressure, and the humidity is all coming in here now. So now we can sit here and watch until the uh, balloon pops. 